share my screen and we're going to look a little bit in a, in a moment at Matthew 24. Now this chapter is huge. This chapter is uh, something that's been dealt with for many, many years. I truly, honestly feel like a child when it comes to Matthew 24. There are so many things that could be said and so much information that I do not know that I just, I want to just share what the Bible's teaching and uh, go on from there. But I don't have all the answers. There's, there's a lot here that I think is beyond your humble servant. So as we go into Matthew 24, we've already prayed together and may it be that the Lord blesses us with this opportunity to learn something perhaps if you haven't already thought about it before. So let's go ahead and share together Matthew 24 and we will be able to know what it is that God is saying to us at this time. Jesus went up and departed. Now that's very interesting because we remember at the last few comments that he had said to the children of Israel in the city of Jerusalem is that their house is left unto them desolate. Now knowing that Jesus went out and departed, well, what did he go out of? What did he depart from? Well, you know, maybe not in physical sense, but in spiritual sense, Jesus went out from the church he was raised up in. He left his church. He departed from the temple. So I guess it was physical, sorry. <laughs> he literally left the church that he was in, and he left them as though they were without him. They didn't want the spirit of truth which Christ offered, and as a result, they left or were left with a Christless experience. You know, people are dying regularly, going into Christless graves. Well, these people were living without Christ, and we know what it caused just shortly thereafter. This is only a few days before his crucifixion, and we know that Jesus was crucified as a result of that. And so Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So they were really excited about the buildings, like, wow, Lord, how could you leave and speak so plainly about Israel and, and about the temple and the holy city? And they wanted to show him the buildings. So they were looking more on the physical rather than the spiritual. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, he was in the temple, right? And we know the Temple Mount is something that people go to today. And I just think it's very interesting how even today you'll see people go to what is called the Wailing Wall. You've heard of that, right? You've seen the Wailing Wall. Well, people, people will sit before the wall and they'll pray like this. And well, I think it's very interesting how Jesus said there's not going to be one stone left upon another. Yet there's still part of the wall that's been there for how many years? I don't know. I just think that perhaps there's something a little confusing there because I choose to listen to the words of Jesus and just think that perhaps there has been a bit of misunderstanding either in my mind or in history. So I think that the whole place was raised. What that means is R-A-Z-E-D, like put down on the ground. It wasn't raised up. It was raised like, you know, completely uh, flattened. If I'm wrong, please help me understand better, but I don't know that if I was at the Wailing Wall, I would believe that was actually part of the original temple because Jesus said what he said. And uh, if he's wrong, <laughs> there's got to be an explanation that must be understood by the Bible because um, he said there's not going to be one stone left upon another. Now, you could say that they were looking at the temple and the Wailing Wall is one of the walls of the temple. Well, okay. Maybe, but I think the whole system of buildings and the, the whole entire structure is likely what Christ was referring to. Now I say likely because I'm not sure. So maybe this is a hang up in my own mind. Anyways, I'm just thinking that it was likely that the disciples looking at the physical were not seeing the spiritual as much. And the reason why Christ said that the physical building that you're looking at right now will be thrown down and there shall not be left one stone upon another, is actually because the children of Israel rejected the spirit of truth. You see? And you know, it's funny. I was in a meeting just, was it yesterday morning? Yesterday morning. And it went on for two full hours. It was a good meeting. A lot of very dedicated, well-rounded, 
spiritual, spiritually minded people. And in this meeting, we were discussing doctrine. And the purpose was to be able to understand better who's saying what and why are they saying that? And what can we agree on? What do we disagree on? Well, it was about two full hours of discussing spiritual things and important things, things that, that matter. There are a lot of things that we don't understand as Christians and we want to understand. Oh, that's what it is. I got it. The spirit of truth. There are things we disagree on. Okay. It's just, there's no way around it. I don't think the same way you do. You don't think the same way I do about every single thing. Now, there are some people I feel like I'm closer to in regard to being a spiritual brother or a spiritual sister. But I think I can tell you this from that meeting we had yesterday that lasted two hours that discussed lots of different topics on theology, mainly focusing on the humanity of Christ. We tried to come away with a cordial, friendly, loving attitude toward one another. And I, it worked. I, I was actually very thankful that we had that interaction. Now, so even though we don't all say the same exact thing, I think we can all have the spirit of truth. Now, what does that mean? If my heart, which is my mind, you know, okay, yes, your heart does have memory. I get it. But the biblical rendition of what your heart means is it's your mind. Okay. So my heart and mind wants truth. I really do. Does that mean I understand everything about truth? No, I'm, I don't. I, I know I don't. I'm not God. He understands more things than I do. And if I was understanding what he knows, then I could create all kinds of things and I'd have lots of things because I could create, right? But I can't. And so the truth about the matter is that though I don't know all the truth, I really want it. And what that means is if somebody says something I'm not fully educated on or I'm not totally aware about, I haven't studied it myself, instead of saying, whoa, you're a heretic, that's not what I believe, Instead, I'm going to say, well, you know, hey, I haven't studied that. Maybe I should look into it further. You know, there are things that you know well enough about that if it's brought up, it's probably not worth studying. I've got a number of things at the top of my head I can mention. But in regard to a group of people that want to know, I think we could have the spirit of truth. And so the disciples, let's go back now to Matthew 24. Forget that two-hour meeting that we talked about yesterday that I had. What about this group of 12 disciples? Jesus is speaking to just a few of them. Well, all of them right now, and a few of them are going to ask him in a moment personally. But these brethren didn't all believe the same thing. You can't tell me that they all had the same theology. Matthew and Judas and the other Judas, which is probably Bartholomew. You have Andrew and Philip. You have Peter. You have, you know, all different people. They all believed different things. And yet, for three and a half years, they were able to spend time together. Why? I think because their focus was what was in Christ Jesus. And he had the spirit of truth. I just think that if we had the spirit of truth, then we wouldn't be like the Israelites that rejected Jesus because he came in with an idea that we weren't really familiar with and we didn't want that. We wanted something else. I think we, we would be able to say, hey, you know what? I don't get it but I trust him and I want him to lead me into all truth as was promised through the comforter that he said would come John 16 13. So that's what I think is really important here is Jesus was trying to teach them spiritual things and he was using a physical actual building to help them understand spiritual things and this this entire chapter is physical but also symbolic which is you know he had approaches this idea of answering the questions of the disciples geniusly. It's beautiful. So I think it's important for me and my experience right now, like as a Christian today, it's experience, It's important for me to understand that I need the spirit of truth. Like we had two hours in a meeting where very controversial subject uh, was at hand. We were able to discuss things that were beautiful and we came away basically just saying, hey, thanks for your time. God bless you. This was a wonderful meeting. We'll meet again next week, right? So it was good. Anyways, I hope that we can have that same thing in our experiences as well. 
And so now Christ had already gone out of this building. This building meant nothing for him any longer. And the reason why it was destroyed is because the people that were living at that time, other than the disciples and a few others, did not want the spirit of truth. And that's why there was destruction coming from the Romans that finally raised the temple and the city. It was because they didn't want what Christ offered, but I want it, and I hope you do too. You see how that fits in now? Okay, now verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, you remember we've been there already, haven't we? We talked about the Mount of Olives, and people were hungry, and there was a lot of folk, you know, kind of running around trying to sell stuff and all that. Well, anyways, the Mount of Olives, the disciples, when he sat there, the disciples came unto him privately. So now there's a few, James, Peter, and Andrew, I think it is. I don't remember exactly. They said, tell us, when shall these things be? You know, like the destruction of the temple that you just talked about. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, these are different questions. There's really two. This one question summed up in these two separate categories here. But I think what you could say is, it's really one question. When will these things of the destruction of God's holy temple be? And it must be, it's when you're coming, and it must be at the end of the world, because like God's temple, God's temple's not going to be thrown down. Are you kidding me? That's God's temple. Well, yeah, but, you know, the problem is, the temple means nothing. The temple literally means stones and marble and gold and a few other things, but nothing. What matters is what the temple symbolizes, what it represents. Here on earth, it represented a bigger picture up in heaven. And so this one down on earth, if God's people didn't want it, he's going to destroy it. And it wasn't about the end of the world. It was about the end of the Jewish nation and their, their uh, how would you say, blasphemous sacrifices that they were offering upon the altar. And so this idea of the disciples asking the questions, it's, I think it's one. Like, this is huge. Everything you're talking about with the destruction of the temple, this must be when you come in the end of the world. I mean, when's that going to happen? Well, Jesus was talking about two different things, really. The destruction of the temple would have been in just a few years, actually 40. And all of that symbolized the second coming of Jesus, right? So you can go back and look now where it says in verse 4, Jesus answered and said, Oh, by the way, this is really interesting. The sign of thy coming. You know, the coming is something that Christ knew would happen. The disciples knew would happen. They've already discussed this several times. Jesus had mentioned numerous times that when he comes, he will come in the glory of his Father and in the glory of the Holy Spirits or holy angels with him. No, that doesn't mean the angels are the Holy Spirit. But you could call them Holy Spirits and be totally biblical. Okay, now, so going on to this verse right here, 2 Thessalonians 2, it says in verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, this coming here is actually parousia. Okay, you can see that there. In this other one, I'm going to see that same word. Look, at it says, if you triple click, it's the same word, parousia. And so um, I think it's really interesting how we have what is the sign of your coming? And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we have a personation of the coming of Christ. Although we know, according to uh, several different reasons, but one of them being that Sister White makes it pretty clear, Satan cannot personate the coming of Christ. He can do a lot of, th a lot of things that makes it seem as though Christ has come. But the second coming in itself is not going to be personated. Christ will be in the air, in the clouds of heaven, with all the glorious angels with him. Um, I think I could say all and mean that. I'm not sure about all, but lots of them. And then, and I'm only saying that because I know that heaven is not empty when he comes. The Father will be there. And I'm not sure if the Father will be alone or not. I'm just, that's just something I don't know. Anyway, when um, Christ is in heaven with the clouds above the earth, he's not going to land on it because he'll do that, you know, after the thousand years. And you can read about that in Zechariah 14. But what happens is when... Christ comes and he's in the clouds, he will call forth those that are faithful, uh, were faithful unto death. They will be resurrected, and then we which are alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, and then from that point we'll ever be with the Lord. Well, actually he sends his angels to come and get those that are resurrected to be brought to the Lord. So really the first face you're going to see is that of your angel. 
I'm going to be looking for my father as well, but I certainly will be looking for Jesus also because I really want to see the, the glory of all of it. My angel, my father in, <laughs> in his new, you know, living being. And because we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And I want to see Jesus. I want to see the one who gave so much for me. That almost brings me to tears just saying it. Anyways, going back over here to uh, Matthew 24, verse 4. Jesus answered and said, In regard to the coming that you just asked about, take heed, listen, take serious heed, that no man deceive you. You don't want to be deceived. Now, this deception is something the enemy wants to do all the time. He's constantly wanting to deceive. That's his business. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Okay, well, this one here, this, this idea of false prophets, let's, let's read about that in Acts 13, verse 6. When they had gone through the isles of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a what? A false prophet. He was a Jew whose name was son of Jesus. Because Bar means son of. That's why Bar, Bar Abbas is an interesting thought too, because Bar Abba, son of the father. Well, this false false prophet was named Bar Jesus, the son of Jesus. Well, we know there was false prophets in the days of the apostles. Let no man deceive you because many shall come in my name saying, I'm Christ and shall deceive many. And then it says in verse six, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And I know that some of the apostles were still alive when Jerusalem was destroyed. So they have seen in their day, false Christs, they had seen in their day, the rumors of wars. We can also know that there was wars, you know, all over the place in that time. Of course, you just know about the Caesars and all the various things that they did in history. And you realize that they were sure that there were wars and they heard about them as war as well. But see that you be not troubled. You know, a lot of times people will, will bring this up and they'll say, look at false Christs and wars and rumors of wars. Jesus says, don't be troubled about these things. That's, I've never really heard anybody focus on that so much. They focus on the statistics of wars and how if we had been translated as was supposed to be done in 1888 or shortly thereafter or shortly before, then we would not have seen all the wars that have gone on since then. Well, see that you be not troubled is not something I've really heard about much. And so I'd like to just take a moment to think about that. Wars and rumors of wars and false Christs and deceptions and all those things are not really what we should be troubling ourselves with because all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So yeah, those things are important, but you know, they're not really what describes the end of time. Well, nation shall rise against nation. I know that that happened in the days of the apostles, kingdom against kingdom. We know that's true. And there shall be famines. Now, what about famines? Let's, let's think about that for a second. There is another way to translate famines, or at least consider famine. It's called dearth. If you triple-click that word, famines, you'll come up with dearth. There will be famines, and, you know, think about it. Okay, let me go to this one. If you think about, I think it's Romans chapter 15 or 16. I don't remember the verse. I'm just, this is coming to my head. Paul had said that he's going to be traveling uh, and help those that were suffering from the famine. And he was going to the Israelites who were suffering uh, during the time of the famine. So we know for sure that there were famines during the times of the apostles. When they learned from Christ, there will be wars, there will be rumors, there will be false Christs. One of them will be named Bar Jesus. You're going to have, you know, uh, famines and dearth and all this sorts of stuff the disciples or the apostles were able to look around at that time and realize like, wow, we're actually seeing all the things that Jesus talked about. He told us not to be troubled about these things, but he said that they would be coming. Nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And so the, the apostles during that time, they were actually seeing these things. What about pestilences? Well, notice what it says in Acts 28 verse 9. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases, that's pestilences, in the island, came and were healed. And so the reason, part of the reasons why there was diseases or pestilences here is because God wanted his children to trust in him and his power, just as his son did, as we know about in, I, I love bringing up this verse, Acts 2.22, 
Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, which was the Son of God, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God the Father did by his Son, Jesus Christ, in the midst of you all, as your fathers or you yourselves also know. So the point of this verse is that the miracles, the wonders, and the signs are what God did by him. So God the Father did them, the miracles, by him. And if you're blessed to be part of this scenario where you're around pestilences, well then maybe the Lord will do miracles through you too. And so when this was done, others also which were diseased, they came to who? The apostles. And were healed. Okay, so God worked with power to heal through his son, Jesus Christ, and God worked with power to heal through his servants, the apostles, just the same. And guess what? If you are called upon by God to work a miracle, it's not you that does it. It's the power of God that does it through you. And there is an interaction of angels as well. You can read about that in the Bible in Matthew chapter 8, but also you can find it in the writings of Sister White pretty clearly. And so going back to Matthew 24 with these pestilences, and it says earthquakes. Now, earthquakes in diverse places, so not just one place, but different places. Well, there was an earthquake just a few days later because Jesus, there was an earthquake when he was on the cross, right? But if you go to Acts 16, 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. The keeper of the prison was about to kill himself, but, you know, of course, the apostles said, no, don't do that. We want you to be saved. And as a result, he was actually able to be brought to the Lord. So all these ideas of kingdom against kingdom, famine, pestilences, earthquakes, etc. These are all things that the apostles saw with their own eyes. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, the beginning is simply the start, the first part, the, uh, you know, the beginning of sorrows. Now, we know this to be birth pangs, Right. Um, a pain or a pang or throw, especially in childbirth, travail. So these are the beginning of birth pains. And ladies, you know much more than I do. Though I have watched my wife bring forth two children, we were honored to have our children in our home. And the reason being is my wife is a nurse. She worked in um, child delivery. She knows about child delivery. She's actually shaped in a way she knows that will bring forth children easily. And so, I mean, everything was for us. And, and the, do- the nurse or midwife actually said that we brought forth picture perfect deliveries through my wife. So, but I, okay, you know better than I do about this, but I've seen it twice. And I know that, you know, when the wife said to me, sweetheart, it's time. I was like, time for what, sweetheart? I, I need to go to the hospital. I was like, oh no. <laughs> I st- you know, we were already had the bag prepared. We already had, I knew where the keys were already. I knew how to get to the hospital. We had enough fuel in the tank. I knew that I was supposed to grab the food, the bag of food and water and all the things that I would need and she would need. We took off, right? Well, not to go to the hospital necessarily. Sorry, I'm, I'm confusing the situation. To call the midwife. So we got everything prepared and we were all ready. And, and uh, we were able to know that within a short time, my wife, with these birth pangs, was going to bring forth a child. Well, we know, of course, that at first she had serious birth pains, but then they would ease up and go away. For, you know, an hour or two they were gone, and then they would come back again. And she realized about the right time, so many minutes apart when she was having contractions, that, okay, we need now to call the midwife. And so what was happening is she knew that because of the amount of contractions that she was going on as a woman ready to bring forth a child that the birth was about to come and so that's where you get the idea where the wars and the rumors of wars and the earthquakes and the famines the pestilence all that stuff coming to the how would you say more birth pains if you will this the amount of those activities coming and going more rapidly than ever before we know that's a good reason why we could look around and say This world can't go on very much longer. Like the baby's about to come forth. And if it doesn't, then something's going to break, right? So that's really what's happening in the world today. We can see all over the world. You just go onto the internet for a minute and ask the question, what 
major natural disasters are going around right now in the world. And you're going to find video after video after video that are not all covering the same thing with horrific, astronomical kind of natural disasters going on all the time. You don't have a month in the world anywhere where there's not something going on, either an infestation of bugs or too much heat, too much water, flooding, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, the, all of it. Killings and, you know, I mean, the, the, the stuff that's going on with the human heart is even just as bad. So that's the idea of where we get this idea of using these sections for the purpose of showing that we are close to the coming of Christ. Then, after all these things, shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Now, this word afflicted is actually uh, akin to being persecuted, okay? So you are brought into affliction, anguish, you are burdened, you are brought through tribulation or troubles. Now, wait a minute. Jesus was saying that before he comes, his people will be brought through affliction. That's tribulation. So what about those that say there's such thing as pre-trib, right? Wait a minute. They will bring you up to be afflicted and shall what? Kill you. That doesn't mean symbolically. That means they will actually take your life. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, some of us know what that means because, you know, when we accepted the idea that God actually has a son, his name is Jesus Christ, but before that, he was the son of God or Michael or the angel of the Lord described in the Old Testament. You realize that people don't like that subject. They don't like it in some ways very, very much. And they will cast you out of the synagogue and tell you that you're a heretic and being rude and ignoring your phone calls or your texts, etc. They'll block you on the phone or that, you know, they'll put your emails into spam or block you there as well. So we know that this is a real thing for some of us, but we haven't yet come to the point where a major majority of us have been killed. We're not afflicted in such a way that they will kill us yet. I say yet because it's coming. This is a reality. We will be afflicted, afflicted unto death. We will, many of us will have to suffer that experience. Well, as far as I know, if I have my mind as it is right now, I'm looking forward to that time because I know that though there is a little bit of affliction here in this world, compared to the eternity that God has prepared for us through his son, there is nothing to compare. If I have, if, if God has in my future to have a little bit of pain or a little bit of suffrage, then may it be so for his name's sake. May he be glorified in my reaction to it. You see, I could be frustrated and angry and mad and, you know, throwing my fists on the ground, etc. And I wouldn't represent Christ at all. But if I'm a Christian during that time, and if I bless instead of curse during that time, then I believe God could use my experience in a way that will bring glory to his name. And so that's what I'm looking for, is I want that experience to be a glory to his name, no matter what he brings me through. And I want everybody to have that experience as a Christian as well. So may it be. You will be delivered up and afflicted. They'll be killing you. You'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake, not just hated of a few friends. You're going to be hated of all nations. In fact, all earthly support will be cut off, right? You'll be hated of all nations. Why? Not because you're a Sabbath keeper, not because you're a vegetarian. It is for Christ's sake, for my character's sake, which means if you're following his character, you are a vegetarian and a Sabbath keeper. You're going to say, now, wait a minute, he wasn't a, he wasn't a vegetarian, right? But he has given us an education about foods. I'll just give a little short thing here. In Genesis chapter 1, which is the beginning of this experience of humanity going into sin, he gave them fruits and vegetables, right? And then at the end of the age, when we're brought back to heaven, which is, you could say, the heavenly Eden, then what we have for nourishment is fruit from the tree of life. That's actually what it was at the beginning, fruit of the tree of life. I said vegetables as well, but that came in later. So you have the fruit and the fruit, right? And so it says in Isaiah 65, toward the end, that lions will eat straw like an ox, and the wolf and the lamb will eat together. They won't eat each other, and the little child will be able to lead them, and the uh, child will also play at the hole of an asp or a cockatrice, a, a, a snake, because there's not going to be eating and biting each other in heaven. It's going to be a beautiful experience. And so if I don't eat or rather kill lambs there, 
what will I be eating? Well, fruit from the tree of life. And so Jesus, at the end of time, has made it clear to us that as we're preparing to get into heaven, we will be eating more consistently with the heavenly diet. And I think it's, it's very important to consider that, especially in light of, you know, this idea that we will have Christ's character for my name's sake. Now, then shall many be offended, okay, and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Now, who is this? Well, they shall deliver you up. I think the you is still the context. You're going to be hated of all nations for my sake, and then shall many, many of who? Many of you. Not many children of Babylon, not many children of Egypt. We're talking about many of you shall be offended, and many of you will give up the faith and betray your brothers and your sisters as a result of trying to keep yourself alive, and you will hate one another. Oh, you used to love one another. You used to spend time on Zoom and fellowship and sing with one another and pray with one another. You go to each other's house and you'd eat fellowship meal with one another. But now, now what? Now you can't stand at each other because you're just trying to stay alive and you don't want any part of that persecution. You don't, you don't want to be killed. You don't want to be afflicted. You don't want to be hated. You want to be loved and you want to be nourished and taken care of and provided for. You're one of those people that would rather be taken care of on the earth rather than suffer. I don't want to be like that. Lord God, please help me to go through whatever you put me through for your name's sake. Now, there are going to be many false prophets that will arise and will deceive many. Not just a few. This is deceiving many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Again, this is many. And many will be deceived. The love of many shall wax cold. And it's going to be ugly. It's going to be terribly ugly unfortunately. But he that shall endure, what is this word endure? This is the same idea of having patience. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Okay. The same who? Well, the same that endures. Endures what? Endures the deception, the iniquity, the false prophets, the betrayals, the hating one of another, the being offended the killing, if you are able to endure those things unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, wait a minute. The disciples were just like, when will be the end of all things? Like, when is it going to be that you come? And he's telling them, you're going to be hated. You're going to be killed. You're going to be, you know, afflicted. You're going to deceive people. You're going to be, you're going to be, you know, betrayed. You're going to turn against each other. And they're like, whoa, really me? Well, that's a hard saying. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of us are not as converted as we believe we are. And unfortunately, some of us are going to be lost. We're going to be deceived. We have got to surrender our hearts now, every single day, forever, as often as possible. And if we do that, if God is able to teach us to be humble and surrendering, If we can be completely submissive to the Word of God at all times, even when your internet goes a little sour, right? Like my experience earlier today. When we have the Spirit of Christ, we will be saved. It's impossible not to be. But the thing is, we wrestle against self. That's that's the issue. I want to be the one in charge. I want to get what I want. I don't want to be treated like that. I want to be treated with respect. Who are you talking to? You know, I mean... I want to be the guy that just accepts what comes my way. Not being walked on. I'm not, I'm not talking about being a, a doormat or a chicken. I'm saying I want to be submissive to what God allows me to go through. And, you know, I want to stand up for what's right. I want to speak up at the right time, etc. I want to do it in love. I don't want to be a fool. But I want to do it in the spirit of Christ. And, and I think that's important for our context here. He that shall endure... All the things we just talked about. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Oh, okay. So we just talked about the end here. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And after the gospel is preached in all the world, then shall the end come. Well, wait a minute. The apostles were just talking about in chapter 24, 
verse 3, what shall be the end of the world? So when Jesus used the word end, it was pretty, you know, like in the context of, by the way, you're going to be hated, you're going to be deceived, you're going to like betray each other, everybody's going to be against you, and then shall the end come, right? After the gospel goes to the whole world. And part of the reason why they are condemned, part of the reason why they're betrayed, part of the reason why they're arraigned before judges and kings and counselors and princes and captains and sheriffs and all the other, is because it's for a witness unto them. You see, if you can receive the persecutions of this world as a Christian, if you can endure all the things that were just mentioned, then God is going to use you as a witness in a way that he never would have been able to before. You see, because some of those judges, counselors, captains, sheriff, you know, princes and all those others, they won't come to church. They won't come to our Zoom meetings. They won't sit in a Bible study. They won't listen to the music that you sent to them. They will not be influenced. But when they're standing there in front of you and they're treating you very poorly and they know they are, and you're treating them as a respectable, honorable person that should receive truth, even though it seems like you're deceived, I really want you to be saved, they're going to receive a witness through you. And so I think it's really important for us to understand how we are going to be brought into those situations for a purpose. God has a plan. And then shall all, rather, and then shall the end come, right? So I think this first part of the section in Matthew 24 is to me very, very pressing. I'll tell you a story about myself in this regard. Many years ago, it was 25 years ago now, I was reading for myself through the book of Mark. And I, as I do generally, if I read a section and I don't fully get it, I like to think that I'm listening to the voice of God through his ministration of, of his spirit to read it again. And so in this case, I read Mark chapter 13 and I thought, well, you know what? That was good, but I don't feel like I got it. So I read it again. The next day I was like hearing that voice, read it again. So I read it again. I, the next day I read it again. For about two full weeks, I think it was, 10 days or maybe more, I was reading Mark chapter 13 again and again and again. And I kept wondering like, Lord, why am I so impressed with this chapter? Why do I need to know about it? Well. Mark 13 goes over a similar ground to what Matthew 24 goes over. And then one morning I was sitting under a big tree and I realized I, re I got it. It's talking about me, you see. It, you know, when I was first reading it, like they're going to be hated, they're going to be abused, they're going to be afflicted, you know, the people all over the place are going to be hated. And I kind of put it off onto other people. But then that one morning I realized like, these words are talking to me, like to Daniel. And I remember at that point kind of knowing, I, di I didn't hear a voice from heaven or anything, but I kind of knew that God was calling me to be one of his martyrs at the end of time. Now, whether that happens or not, I don't know. I'm not a prophet. But I was so convinced at that point that I had just heard the voice of God to me that I resolved like, okay, God, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. Let, let's go forward and let's do this. Let, let, let me live for you so that I'm willing to die for you. And, uh, I want to be, I want to stay that way. So for me, Matthew 24 is very potent. It is very deep to me. It's something that I don't read lightly and I don't think it's pointing to others. I think we're being talked to. to. I think it's talking about the believers. You're going to be hated. You're going to betray. You're going to be deceived. I want the gospel to go to the world through people like you, but you've got to be willing to follow me. You see, I think that's what Christ was saying. And so for me, it's, it's, this is a meaningful chapter and uh, one that I hope to have in my mind in the future if, in fact, God calls me to endure whatever trials he has in mind. It could be that I go someday in a car accident. Who knows? And, you know, I just out like a light. I don't know. I'm not a prophet, but it could be that I'm honored to stand for the Lord at the end. So may it be according to his will. I want to encourage every one of you to take this seriously and to think about your future 
What will it be for you if God calls you to represent him before kings and counselors and captains and perhaps in a situation where you wouldn't place yourself? What are you going to do? Be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and make those decisions before they come to pass so that when it does come to pass, you'll be ready for it. All right, let's pray. Lord of heaven, I want to thank you for this. I pray that you'd please lead and guide us that we can continue to understand what it is that you're saying to your people, the churches. I ask that you would lead us that no matter what comes to us in our future, you will help us to understand that you have a plan and it is bigger than our life. Our life matters because that's how you reflect your image to people, but sometimes you need us to lay down our lives and you have a bigger purpose. So if you have that in your mind for me or for anybody here that's listening, I pray that you would be glorified in it, that you will not allow our blood to be shed in vain, but rather you will use it for your sake and your glory. Thank you for this and please continue to guide us that we can be honorable servants and we can be uh, those that are willing to love you so much that we would rather die than willingly commit sin, even in the realm of our thoughts. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, maybe I would share a couple of, uh, of my thoughts here, uh, especially on Matthew 24, verse 14. Verse 14, my understanding is Jesus is really telling us we ought to be going out to preach the three angels' message which is the one true God message to the world. And when that is completed, when that is witnessed to the world through our experiences in this world, then the end will come. I don't disagree, but I, I also think the other is a reality that some of us will have to be before kings and counselors, yes. Yes, you know, we will have to witness before the whole world, before kings and counselors, you know. Yeah. And that's the only opportunity that they have to hear the gospel truth, the closing work of the everlasting gospel. They're not going to spend time like, you know, Charlie, you know, uh, give me a Bible study. No, <laughs> we have to stand before them in chains and they have no option. They have to listen to what we have to say. Amen. And they have to judge. Well, we may be judged negatively, yes, but they have to listen. And that may be the last opportunity that they have to listen to the everlasting gospel, just like King Agrippa. Right, you know, he says that now, almost now uh, persuaded me to be a Christian. Amen. And he said that, and well, you know, he lost his opportunity. Right. Good point. Thank you. Daniel, just your comments on heaven and not knowing whether it was empty or not empty. I left a, a comment in the... Um, the Zoom thing there. Um, my understanding, and we all believe that um, before Christ was begotten, the Father was by himself. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. Um, so he, there is periods of affinity that he's been by himself. Mm -hmm. um, when all heaven is empty, the, the, the language that's used in the spirit of prophecy is that it was actually empty. Heaven was emptied. So that the Father's only there. And to back that up in the great controversy, for the, re the second coming, um, when Christ presents his trophies, his, um, which is his people that have been raised from the dead, um, we're met with the Father at the gates, and it's him and him only. Um, I think that's... Um, I can't speak for the unfallen worlds, because we know that the, uh, the unfallen worlds, as um, Alan White was taken into vision and shown even Enoch and... And, and those that have, haven't fallen from those other planets, um, I, can't, I can't vouch for that. But heaven itself, I see, is a different place than the unfallen worlds. Mm -hmm. So the language I understand is that um, heaven was completely empty and only one person left there, and that is the Father. I mean, I stand to be corrected, but um, it's, it's um, my belief anyway. That's what I read. That's how I understand. Good. You know, it's actually... It, uh, honestly, it's similar to what I've believed as well in the past, but for a moment I wasn't sure if I had read or knew about something that was, you know, um, enabling angels to be there as well. But I, I... Well, actually, you've got to look at the, um, the aspect of the sanctuary itself, the message itself as well. Um, in the, the earthly sanctuary, when you go in the most holy place, you know, you see the Ark of the, te uh, the, te uh, the Covenant with the, the Ten Commandments in, in there. You have the two angels that touch their wings, but their faces are actually pointed 
at the mercy seat and behind, beyond, beyond the mercy seat itself is the Ten Commandments, which is something they will be um, studying for the rest of their lives. The government, that's the accusation that gets put against um, God is that his laws are unjust. The interest they have with um, the unfallenness of, of earth itself and the plan of redemption is focused on the government of God, which is the law. Yeah. As I said. And, you know, to be left behind <laughs> and, uh, and not see the, the, the final um, hurrah, you could say, hurrah! The American army does that, doesn't it? Hurrah! <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that is something that I, I couldn't see any angel missing out at all. That's just, again, my, my thoughts. I want to share something with you because in The Desire of Ages, it tells about the two angels. I don't know if it's The Desire of Ages, but I do know that it's talking about the two angels that were with Christ all the time when he was on the earth. Yep. yep. They chose not to go up with Christ to be brought before the Father so that they could stay back and comfort those disciples who just had him leave in the, in their their sight. So, I mean, yeah, I, I it's, it, that brought me to tears the first time I read it. I thought, no way, how amazing that would be. <laughs> their, interest, their interest in the plan of salvation for us fallen people uh, is immense because, you is. know, imagine before, we, it, before there was any fall, um, they didn't know what sin was all about. They didn't realize, you know, they didn't didn't understand what a lie was, what it was to to die, you know, and 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 all this sort of stuff. So the comfort they give us, they they do they play play such a, an important role in that intercession between us and Christ, and and the mission that is being given to them by God the Father. Right. Um, it's, it's crazy stuff, isn't it? Amen. It is huge. It's beautiful. Uh, I, I don't want any of us to go away, you know, after all these meetings, especially in, you know, the, the, the period of time that we are going through these uh, last day experiences. I mean, it's very troubling, as uh, Daniel often said, it's uh, very ugly. You know, it's going to be very, very difficult for everyone. But I, I don't think we ought to look at this, you know, from this perspective at all. We should look at it, as, at least what I think, as an adventure. Because this is the privileged last generation. This is the time where, you know, ancient men of old, they look forward to this time. And we are right here in this time, you know, not by our own choosing, of course. <laughs> but uh, we ought to look at it as, well, we've been given the opportunity. And now is the time when God will fulfill the covenant that he has with his people. And... Isn't that uh, inspiring to know that, you know, we are the chosen generation? And uh, instead of uh, looking at it to say, well, okay, it's a time of trouble, but it's also a time of joy. And we need the patience, as Paul says, uh, we glory in tribulation, right? Because tribulation workers what? Workers patience. And patience workers experience, and experience workers hope. Uh, this is our blessed hope. And the, ex the, the, the patience that we have, we are looking at it with cheerfulness in our hearts. We are looking at it with joy in our heart, looking forward to it. And if we are not prepared to go all the way for our Lord and our Saviour and to be a martyr, then I think uh, God will be a little bit disappointed with us. Hmm. Yeah. It's true. You, you, you're right. We should have that focus and... Uh... Glad you brought it up. Thank you. Just another point on that. Um, that, that time and tribulation coming through with our characters. Um, there, there is a, a passage in the Spirit of Prophecy where it talks about that, that Christ, um, well, for the Father will put to sleep those that he knows that won't endure that time. Mm -hmm. And I guess that there, there's a lot of elderly people, young people that haven't had that experience, and yet they've been found um, to be uh, written in the book of life for eternity. Um, the endurance, the 144,000, um, they are a special, special group. Those that are still heaven bound that are out past that, I, I, uh, she says that they will be put to sleep prior to that time. Yeah. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. <laughs> um, too many I've heard say, oh, I want to be part of that group. Well, not really. I don't think that's the right attitude towards that. We should be. Um, <laughs> We should be setting our eyes to being part of the 144,000. Amen. Um, if, 
if, if God permits us to be part of that and, and we submit our wills to God in such a way that Christ is in our minds completely all the time and our minds, that's all that we ever think of, I think that character will develop to that point that um, we'll endure that without any pain and suffering as, as Christ did on the cross. Amen. I don't know whether you can relate to that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you.